Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage John J. DeJoya, President of Georgetown University, Edward Montgomery, Dean, McCourt School of Public Policy, and James B. Comey, Director, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Gaston Hall. It's a great pleasure for our university to host this important conversation this morning. And I wish to thank the many members of our Georgetown community and our guests from the FBI who have joined us for today's event. We gather now to hear FBI Director James B. Comey offer his perspective on questions of law enforcement and race, a topic that demands our most careful and serious attention as a nation, as members, as members of our communities. This is a topic whose importance and urgency have been exemplified in the events from Ferguson, Missouri, to Cleveland, Ohio, to Staten Island, New York, and indeed in communities across our country. At this current moment when our country seeks a greater understanding, a renewed sense of responsibility for one another, a stronger mutual trust, we're grateful for this opportunity to provide a venue for dialogue on these matters. We're thankful to have our McCourt School of Public Policy as an academic partner for this morning's event. And after Director Comey's remarks, our audience will have the opportunity to ask questions moderated by our McCourt School Dean, Edward Montgomery. And I want to thank Dean Montgomery for this, playing this role today. I wish to take a few moments to introduce Director Comey, who took on his position leading the FBI in 2013 after a long and distinguished legal career. A religion major at the College of William and Mary and a graduate of Columbia Law School, Director Comey has served as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York and as Deputy Attorney at the Department of Justice before assuming his current role. As leader of the FBI, he has advanced the Bureau's mission of protecting the lives of our nation's citizens with a personal attention to ensuring that this mission is accomplished in a manner that recognizes and protects the liberties that are at the heart of our shared values as a nation. For many years, the FBI has required all its new agents to visit the United States Holocaust Museum here in Washington as part of their training. When Mr. Comey became director, he added to that training a visit to the Martin Luther King Memorial, not far from our campus here, to bring a deeper understanding of our nation's history into the Bureau's current practices. As Director Comey put it, a reminder of the need for fidelity to the rule of law and the dangers in becoming untethered to oversight and accountability. We gather this morning here in Gaston Hall as we have throughout our history. Now for more than a century, this hall has served as one of the important places for public discourse and discussion here in Washington. And today we deepen that history as we come together to engage in this dialogue. It is through such dialogue that we build a more inclusive society and strengthen the trust that forms the fabric of our collective well being. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Director James B. Comey. Thank you, President DeJoya. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me here to Georgetown University. I am honored to be here. I wanted to meet with you today, as President DeJoya said, to share with you my thoughts on the relationship between law enforcement and the communities we serve and protect. Like a lot of things in life, that relationship is complicated. Relationships often are. Beautiful Healy Hall, part of and all around where we sit now, was named after this great university's 29th president, Patrick Francis Healy. Healy was born into slavery in Georgia in 1834. His father was an Irish immigrant plantation owner, his mother a slave. Under the laws at that time, Healy and his siblings were considered to be slaves. 
Healy is believed to be the first African American to earn a PhD, the first to enter the Jesuit order, the first to be president of Georgetown University or any predominantly white university. Given Georgetown's remarkable history and that of President Healy, this struck me as the appropriate place to talk about the difficult relationship between law enforcement and the communities we are sworn to serve and protect. With the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, the death of Eric Garner in Staten Island, and the ongoing protests throughout the country, and the assassinations of NYPD officers Wen Jin Liu and Rafael Ramos, we are at a crossroads. As a society, we can choose to live our lives every day raising our families, going to work, and hoping that someone, somewhere, will do something to ease the tension, to smooth over the conflict. We can roll up our car windows, turn up the radio, and drive around these problems. Or we can choose instead to have an open and honest discussion about what our relationship is today, what it should be, what it could be, what it needs to be, if we took more time to better understand one another. Unfortunately, in places like Ferguson and New York City and in some communities across this nation, there is a disconnect between police agencies and the citizens they serve, predominantly in communities of color. Serious debates are taking place about how law enforcement personnel relate to the communities they serve, about the appropriate use of force, and about the real and perceived biases both within and outside of law enforcement. These are important debates. Every American should feel free to express an informed opinion, to protest peacefully, to convey frustration and even anger in a constructive way. That's what makes this democracy great. Those conversations, as bumpy and uncomfortable as they can be, help us understand different perspectives and better serve our communities. Of course, they are only conversations in the true sense of that word if we are willing not only to talk, but to listen to. I worry that this incredibly important and difficult conversation about race and policing has become focused entirely on the nature and character of law enforcement officers, when it should also be about something much harder to discuss. Debating the nature of policing is very important, but I worry that it has become an excuse at times to avoid doing something harder. Let me start by sharing some of my own hard truths. First, all of us in law enforcement must be honest enough to acknowledge that much of our history is not pretty. At many points in American history, law enforcement enforced the status quo, a status quo that was often brutally unfair to disfavored groups. It was unfair to the Healy siblings and to countless others like them. It was unfair to too many people. I am descended from Irish immigrants. A century ago, the Irish knew well how American society and law enforcement viewed them as drunks, ruffians, and criminals. Law enforcement's biased view of the Irish lives on in the nickname we still use for the vehicles we use to transport groups of prisoners. It is, after all, the paddy wagon. The Irish had some tough times, but little compares to the experience on our soil of black Americans. That experience should be part of every American's consciousness. And law enforcement's role in that experience, including in recent times, must be remembered. It is our cultural inheritance. There is a reason that I require all new agents and analysts to study the FBI's interaction with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to visit his memorial in Washington as part of their training. And there is a reason I keep on my desk a copy of Attorney General Robert Kennedy's approval of J. Edgar Hoover's request to wiretap Dr. King. It is a single page. The entire application is five sentences long. It is without fact or substance and is predicated on the naked assertion that there is, quote, communist influence in the racial situation. The reason I do those things is to ensure that we remember our mistakes and that we learn from them. One reason we cannot forget our law enforcement legacy is that the people we serve and protect cannot forget it either. 
So we must talk about our history. It is a hard truth that lives on. A second hard truth. Much research points to the widespread existence of unconscious bias. Many people in our white majority culture have unconscious racial biases and react differently to a white face than a black face. In fact, we all, white and black, carry various biases around with us. I am reminded of the song from the Broadway hit Avenue Q, Everyone's a Little Bit Racist, a part of which goes like this. Look around and you will find no one's really colorblind. Maybe it's a fact we all should face. Everyone makes judgments based on race. You should be grateful I did not try to sing that. <laughs> but if we can't help our latent biases, we can help our behavior in response to those instinctive reactions, which is why we work to design systems and processes to overcome that very human part of us all. Although the research may be unsettling, it is what we do next that matters most. But racial bias isn't epidemic in law enforcement any more than it's epidemic in academia or the arts. In fact, I believe law enforcement overwhelmingly attracts people who want to do good for a living. People who risk their lives because they want to help other people. They don't sign up to be cops in New York or Chicago or LA to help white people or black people or Hispanic people or Asian people. They sign up because they want to help all people. And they do some of the hardest, most dangerous policing to protect communities of color. But that leads me to my third hard truth. Something happens to people in law enforcement. Many of us develop different flavors of cynicism that we work hard to resist because they can be lazy mental shortcuts. For example, criminal suspects routinely lie about their guilt and nearly everybody that we charge is guilty. That makes it easy for some folks in law enforcement to assume that everybody's lying and that no suspect, regardless of their race, could be innocent. Easy, but wrong. Likewise, police officers on patrol in our nation's cities often work in environments where a hugely disproportionate percentage of street crime is committed by young men of color. Something happens to people of goodwill working in that environment. After years of police work, officers often can't help but be influenced by the cynicism they feel. A mental shortcut becomes almost irresistible and maybe even rational by some lights. The two young black men on one side of the street look like so many others that officer has locked up. Two white men on the other side of the street, even in the same clothes, do not. The officer does not make the same association about the two white guys, whether that officer is white or black. And that drives different behavior. The officer turns towards one side of the street and not the other. We need to come to grips with the fact that this behavior complicates the relationship between the police and the communities they serve. So why has that officer, like his colleagues, locked up so many young men of color? Why does he have that life-shaping experience? Is it because he is a racist? Why are so many black men in jail? Is it because cops, prosecutors, judges, and juries are racist? Because they are turning a blind eye to white robbers and drug dealers? The answer is a fourth hard truth. I don't think so. If it were so, that would be easier to address. We would just need to train, change the way we hire, train, and measure law enforcement, and that would substantially fix it. We would then go get the white criminals we have been ignoring. But the truth is much harder than that. The truth is that what really needs fixing is something only a few like President Obama, are willing to speak about, perhaps because it is so daunting a task. Through the My Brother's Keeper initiative, the president is addressing the disproportionate challenges faced by young men of color. For instance, data shows that the percentage of young men not working or not enrolled in school is nearly twice as high for blacks as it is for whites. This initiative and others like it is about doing the hard work to grow drug-resistant and violence-resistant kids especially in communities of color, so they never become part of that officer's life experience. 
So many young men of color become part of that life, officer's life experience because so many minority families and communities are struggling. So many boys and young men grow up in environments lacking role models, adequate education, and decent employment. They lack all sorts of opportunities that most of us take for granted. A tragedy of American life, one that most citizens are able to drive around because it doesn't touch them, is that young people in those neighborhoods too often inherit a legacy of crime and prison. And with that inheritance, they become part of a police officer's life and shape the way that officer, whether white or black, sees the world. Changing that legacy is a challenge so enormous and so complicated that it is unfortunately easy, easier to talk only about the cops. And that's not fair. Let me be transparent about my affection for cops. When you dial 911, whether you are white or black, the cops come. And they come quickly. And they come quickly whether they are white or black. That's what cops do. In addition to all of the other dangerous and difficult and hard and frightening things that they do, they respond to homes in the middle of the night where a drunken father wielding a gun is threatening his wife and children. They pound up the back stairs of an apartment building, not knowing whether the guys behind the door they're about to enter are armed or high or both. I come from a law enforcement family. My grandfather, William J. Comey, was a police officer. Pop Comey is one of my heroes. I have a picture of him on my wall in my office at the FBI, reminding me of the legacy that I have inherited and that I must honor. He was a child of immigrants. When he was in the sixth grade, his father was killed in an industrial accident in New York, so he had to drop out of school to support his mom and younger siblings. He could never afford to return to school, but when he was old enough, he joined the Yonkers New York Police Department. Over the next 40 years, he rose to lead that department. Pop was the tall, strong, silent type, quiet and dignified and passionate about the rule of law. Back during Prohibition, he heard that bootleggers were running beer through fire hoses between the Bronx and Yonkers. Now, Pop enjoyed a good beer every now and then, but he ordered his men to cut those hoses with fire axes, and then he needed a protective detail because certain people were angry and shocked that someone in law enforcement would do that. But that's what we want as citizens. That is what we expect. And so I keep a picture of Pop on my wall in my office to remind me of his integrity and his pride in his, the integrity of his work. Law enforcement ranks are filled with people like my grandfather. But to be clear, although I am from a law enforcement family and I've spent much of my career in law enforcement, I am not looking to let law enforcement off the hook. Those of us in law enforcement must redouble our efforts to resist bias and prejudice. We must better understand the people we serve and protect by trying to know deep in our gut what it feels like to be a law-abiding young black man walking down the street and encountering law enforcement. We must understand how that young man may see us. We must resist the lazy shortcuts of cynicism and approach him with respect and decency. We must work in the words of New York City Police Commissioner Bill Bratton to really see each other. Perhaps the reason we struggle as a nation is because we've come to see only what we represent at face value instead of who we are. We simply must see the people we serve. But the seeing needs to flow in both directions. Citizens also need to really see the men and women of law enforcement. They need to see what the police see through their windshields and as they walk down the street. They need to see the risks and dangers of law enforcement encountered on every typical late night shift. They need to understand the difficult and frightening work that they do to keep us safe. And they need to give them the respect and the space they need to do their job well and properly. If they take the time to do that, what they will see are officers who are human, who are overwhelmingly doing the right thing for the right reasons, and who are too often operating in communities and facing challenges most of us choose to drive around. One of the hardest things I do as FBI director is call the chiefs and sheriffs of departments around the nation when officers have been killed in the line of duty. I call to express my sorrow and to offer the FBI's help. Officers like Wen Jin Liu and Rafael Ramos 
two of NYPD's finest who were gunned down by a madman who thought his ambush would avenge the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner. I make far too many calls. And there are far too many names of fallen officers on the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial and far too many names etched there each year. Officers Lou and Ramos swore the same oath all in law enforcement do, and they answered the call to serve the people, all the people. Like all good police officers, they move toward danger without regard for the politics or passions or race of those who needed their help, knowing the risks inherent in their work. They were minority police officers killed while standing watch in a minority neighborhood, Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, a neighborhood that they and their fellow officers rescued from the grip of violent crime. For a couple decades ago, Bed-Stuy was shorthand for a kind of chaos and disorder in which good people had no freedom to walk or shop or play or just sit on the front steps and talk. It was too dangerous, but no more thanks to the work of those who chose lives of service and danger to help others. But despite that sacrifice, that selfless service, of these two officers and countless others like them around the country, in some American communities, people view the police not as allies, but as antagonists, and think of them as someone not to be treated with gratitude and respect, but someone worthy of suspicion and distrust. We simply must find a way to see each other more clearly. And part of that has to involve collecting and sharing better information about violent encounters between police and citizens. Not long after the riots broke out in Ferguson late last summer, I asked my staff to tell me how many people shot by police were African American in this country. I wanted to see trends. I wanted to see information. They couldn't give it to me, and it wasn't their fault. Demographic data regarding officer-involved shootings is not consistently reported to us through our Unifying, Uniform Crime Reporting Program. Because reporting is voluntary, our data is incomplete and therefore in aggregate unreliable. I recently listened to a thoughtful big city chief express his frustration with that lack of reliable data. He said he didn't know whether the Ferguson police shot one person a week, one a year, or one a century and that in the absence of good data, quote, all we get are ideological thunderbolts, and what we need are ideological agnostics who use information to try to solve problems. He's right. The first step to understanding what is really going on in our communities and in our country is to gather more and better data related to those we arrest, those we confront for breaking the law and jeopardizing public safety, and those who confront us. Now, data seems like a dry and boring word, but without it, we cannot understand our world and make it better. How can we address concerns about use of force? How can we address concerns about officer-involved shootings if we do not have a reliable grasp on the demographic and the circumstances of those incidents? We simply must improve the way we collect and analyze data to see the true nature of what's happening in our communities. The FBI tracks and publishes the number of justifiable homicides reported by police departments. But again, reporting by police departments is voluntary, and not all departments participate. That means we cannot fully track the incidents in which force is used by police or against police, including non-fatal encounters which are not reported at all. Without complete and accurate data, we are left with ideological thunderbolts, and that helps spark unrest and distrust and does not help us get better. Because we must get better, I intend for the FBI to be the leader in urging departments around this country to give us the facts we need for informed discussion, the facts all of us need, and to help us make sound policy and sound decisions with that information. America isn't easy. America takes work. Today, February 12th, is Abraham Lincoln's birthday. He spoke at Gettysburg about a new birth of freedom because we spent the first four score and seven years of our history with fellow Americans held as slaves, President Healy, his siblings, and his mother among them. As a nation, we have spent the 150 years since Lincoln spoke making great progress, but along the way treating a whole lot of people of color poorly. 
and law enforcement was often part of that poor treatment. That's our inheritance as law enforcement, and it is not all in the distant past. We must account for that inheritance. And we, especially those of us who enjoy the privilege that comes with being the majority, must confront the biases that are an inescapable part of the human condition. We must speak the truth about our shortcomings as law enforcement and fight to get better. But as a country, we must also speak the truth to ourselves. Law enforcement is not the root cause of the problems in our hardest hit neighborhoods. Police officers, people of enormous courage and integrity in the overwhelming main, are in those neighborhoods risking their lives to protect folks from offenders who are a product of problems that will not be solved by body cameras. We simply must speak to each other honestly about all these hard truths. In the words of Dr. King, we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. We all have hard work to do, challenging work, and it will take time. We all need to talk and we all need to listen, not just about easy things, but about hard things too. Relationships are hard. Relationships require work. So let's begin that work. It is time to start seeing one another for who and what we really are. Peace, security, and understanding are worth that effort. Thank you for listening to me today. So I want to thank the director uh, for these very important remarks and uh, let you know that he is, has some time to answer some, some questions. Uh, and we ask people uh, to come up to the mic uh, and uh, form their question. Please, when you do, let us know your name and your affiliation. Uh, and we appreciate, given the importance of the topic, uh, if people want to have questions, to focus them on the issues that uh, the director has raised here today. So uh, with that, uh, the microphone is open. If anybody wants uh, uh, to come up, I'll let that. Uh, see somebody coming up. Uh, <laughs> don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Anabi Adoga. I'm a junior in the College of Arts and Sciences, Gov major, Spanish minor. And I was wondering, Mr. Comey, what has been your most disappointing moment as FBI director, and how did you and the Bureau bounce back from that, learn from it? And on the flip side, what has been your proudest or happiest moment as director? And you know, how has that impacted you and affected you going forward? Yeah, thank you for the question. Maybe I'll, I'll take it in reverse order. Uh, my proudest moment as FBI director is something I've said throughout the FBI is actually related to the topic we're talking about here today. Um, I sent dozens of agents wearing raid jackets to Ferguson, uh, and they knocked on hundreds of doors and every door opened, and everybody spoke to us, whether they were white or black, young or old, male or female. I think because they saw the FBI, you've seen the jackets on TV, right? They saw the kind of orangey, yellow uh, FBI. And I've said to, I speak about this at graduations of agents, I've said, that is a priceless gift, right? That, to be believed, to be seen as somebody who cares about the facts and getting it right, we have to protect that gift. That, that, that was my proudest moment uh, in my 18 months so far. The most difficult, there's been a lot of them uh, that relate to other subjects, uh, terrorism and the loss of innocent life. Obviously, I'm uh, deeply involved in uh, our hostages overseas, trying with lots of other folks to get them home. That has been heartbreaking to me. Um, one of the reasons I'm giving this speech, though, is one of my other disappointments has been um, I felt like we have not... I don't want to tell people what to say, but I have felt like we haven't had a healthy dialogue. And I don't want to see these important issues drift away. Right? We have a tendency to move on to other things as busy people. Um, but these issues, are, especially among, about race and law enforcement, have always been with us, and we can't let it drift away uh, and then talk about it another day. So one of my disappointments has been I've seen dialogue I didn't think was balanced, but I've also seen it start to drift away. And, and I've been determined not to let that happen and to try and encourage good people who all see the world differently than I do, surely, to talk about it. Thank you. 
Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Nicole McCann. I am a freshman in the School of Foreign Service. And I would like to know, sir, besides an improvement in the manner in which police incidents are reported, what other major infrastructural changes would you like to see within the justice system of America? That's a big one. Um, there's a lot of things that are being talked about. I mentioned body cameras. That's an important discussion. Uh, I actually think the most important thing is a, I, I guess there's a risk in saying this, it'll sound vague, but I think it's critical. I think it's hard to hate up close. Right? And that the police in our country need to get out of their cars, both literally and figuratively, and get to know the people they serve, and the people in the communities need to know them. Right? One of the things we've experienced with the economic challenges we've had over the last seven or eight years is police departments have lost funding for all kinds of things that used to allow that seeing to happen. Right? Uh, police athletic leagues. Right? Uh, we run in the FBI citizens academies. Right? We invite citizens to come in and learn about us. Most police departments used to have those kinds of things. They've started to be eliminated and drift away because of lack of funding. Uh, that seems like a, uh, as I said, kind of a vague thing, but that is actually critical to people's trust in the entire justice system. Uh, and if we neglect it, we can have all the rules and all the technology in the world, but underneath it will be a lack of trust and a misunderstanding that'll be corrosive, no matter how good our process and our technology is. So I think that's, that's the way I think about that. Thank you, sir. Hi, I'm Claire. I'm a sophomore in the college. Um, if I understand you, I think what you were, what, what I understood is that you said that the disparate treatment of blacks and white by, whites by law enforcement can often be traced to different situations facing black and white communities. So I was wondering how you would explain then the disparate um, proportion of drug arrests despite almost equal levels of drug use in those two communities. Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, I, I th the, the best answer I can offer is, um, I don't know enough about the data on drug use arrests, uh, but I know a lot about the drug dealing arrests. And so I think in the communities where, where police are patrolling, especially where we're focusing on, are the hardest hit communities where the dealers overwhelmingly turn out to be people of color, not just black folks, but Hispanic folks um, as well, end up being locked up a lot for drug dealing. A lot of use, overwhelmingly the users of drugs um, are Caucasian, something we don't talk about enough. I think you've alluded to it. Um, I've often thought that just focusing on the dealing is like dealing with a hole in your boat just by bailing all the time. Right? You've got to deal with the demand side of it, which is overwhelmingly driven by employed people who are from the suburbs and Caucasian. Another hard truth people don't talk about a lot. Hi, my name is uh, Jack Lynch. I'm a freshman in the college here at Georgetown. And my question is, uh, you mentioned earlier that Officer Ramos and Officer Wang Chu, the assassinated officers in the NYPD, were both minorities working in a predominantly minority neighborhood. Do you think it is a legitimate goal for American law enforcement to try to ensure that uh, the racial diversity of their police forces working in certain neighborhoods are approximately equal to the proportions of uh, racial groups in the neighborhoods they're working in? Yes. In fact, I don't think it's just a goal. It, uh, it's actually, I don't know whether there's a word more important than goal. It is an imperative uh, for all of us in law enforcement to try to reflect the communities we serve. Big challenge for the FBI. FBI is overwhelmingly white and male among my agent force, uh, and I've got nothing against white males. I happen to be one. Uh, but but I, I, the first email I sent to my entire workforce was about this topic. I said, it's a matter of morality, doing what's right, and effectiveness. Right? So if you're not sold on the morality of it, the effectiveness is critical. Right? We can't understand the communities we serve. We can't understand the perspectives of the people we serve if we are all six foot eight inch tall white guys who are slightly awkward and grew up in the New York area, right? We just can't. And so it's, a, it's an imperative. And we have a crisis in a lot of parts of law enforcement. NYPD's done a spectacular job, other departments less so, and my own organization struggles with that. So the answer is yes, sorry for the long answer. I'm uh, Nicholas Manley. I'm in the uh, School of Continuing Studies. And uh, my question is the problem with, with a lot of Ferguson and some of the other incidents that have happened, 
also stems, it, it can also be as much to blame on the culture and, and the communities that we're in as it is the law enforcement environment. It seems that the blame is equally because both have their own preconceived attitudes. So to change one community's attitude towards law enforcement and law enforcement's attitude towards a community, it would seem that the logical step would be to incorporate the two so what is the FBI doing to um, hire or incorporate young black men and women or young men and women of different backgrounds into, into the agency, into the Department of Justice as a whole? Because I think if we, as, as black young black men, sees a, a number of black cops everywhere, or a number of black FBI agents and officials that were going to be more receptive and more trusting, and not, not to say affirmative action is needed, but how are you um, addressing being able to hire people of more diverse background? Because right now the standards are nearly unobtainable for someone who grew up from nothing. Great question. Um, I don't think the standards are unobtainable. I think there are lots of great uh, agents of color, women, uh, who could come work at the FBI, would love working at the FBI. I just got to get them interested in it. And uh, I could talk all day about this, but I'll try to be very short. Uh, the, one of my challenges is the average age of entry for an FBI agent is 29, because we're going to give these folks great power. We want adults who have developed uh, judgment through experience. And, and so I don't know what your plans are after graduation, but my challenge is uh, if you're as good as you probably are because you go to school here, Coca-Cola is going to be after you, Microsoft is going to be after you, Apple's going to be after you, ExxonMobil is going to be after you, and they're going to throw all kinds of dough at you. Uh, and then when you're 29, you'll be thinking, eh, not so much. Go work for the government. So I'm trying to figure out how do I get people in earlier. So I put tremendous amount of effort in my 18 months into hiring right out of college. Because if I can get you right out of Georgetown, you will find out how amazing it is to do good for a living in a different role, in a support role, in an intelligence analyst role. And then when you're in your late 20s, you'll be so in love with this work that you will stay with us and become a special agent. Uh, I, that appeals to me as a strategy to deal with this. But a big part of it is getting people to know us. Right? So we're, we are now devoting tremendous resources to going out to campuses, to historically black colleges and all kinds of colleges. Get to know us what kind of people we are, what we care about. Because as I said, it's hard to hate up close. It's hard to misunderstand up close. If you see our work, the things we care about, the kind of people we are, uh, and I can get my hooks in you before uh, the private sector puts the golden handcuffs on people, uh, I think I can change my numbers. Because I agree with the premise in your question. I have to change the numbers. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll see you. I don't know when you're going to graduate. We'll see you in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Mr. Director. My name is Jason Smith. I'm a first year's master candidate in the um, Security Studies program here. Oh, uh, you mentioned before that these discussions, they often kind of wane off after a while, whether it's a couple weeks or months. In your interactions with um, local police departments or um, you know, any other level of policing or law enforcement, how do you think that kind of these issues can be more you know, formally institutionalized into the actual departments? And how can we make these so, you know, at the local law enforcement level so they don't just become passing issues? Great question. The answer is we have to make sure that we, that we in law enforcement take this conversation and push it out to our police leaders, all law enforcement leaders, uh, and encourage and push and prod and beg them to continue the conversation in their communities. All politics is local. All relationships are local. One of the challenges we face in this country is we have almost 18,000 police organizations. Right? We've got the big cities, uh, but you've got lots of little jurisdictions. Ferguson is a little teeny jurisdiction. So it's not just about reaching the big city chiefs, who are a very thoughtful bunch, in my experience. It's about pushing the conversation beyond that to the hundreds of others that are smaller. One of the things I did is I talked to all of my FBI's in nearly every community in this country. I have almost 500 offices. So I've asked all of my field commanders, take my speech, we have citizens academies, we have lots of relationships with local authorities, engage them. Take, I'm not telling them they should think about it the way I do, but take this into the community and see if we in the FBI can help foster this conversation. The good news is the chiefs, I've already talked to a lot of the big city chiefs, they are grateful for the conversation. They don't want to see it 
drift off, because they know we'll have to talk about it at some point. It's not going to go away by virtue of just us moving on to something else. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Caleb Morrell. I'm a junior here at the School of Foreign Service studying history. And um, my question is, is related to, to history and the question of law enforcement. Um, Martin Luther King said that an unjust law is a human law that is not tethered to an eternal or a natural law. And it seems to me that in our discussion of law enforcement and justice, the conversation is mainly focused on the question of the rule of law. But what discussions of the rule of law and enforcing rule of law can sometimes miss is at times the laws that law enforcement are commanded to enforce are in fact unjust. We've seen that in our own nation's history. So my question is, what is the role of the FBI and of law enforcement in general when they're commanded or ordered to enforce laws that are in fact unjust? It's a very thoughtful question. Uh, if we believe them to be unjust, I believe our obligation is to raise our hand and to speak out, uh, to raise it within, I sit within the Justice Department, to raise it to the Attorney General, uh, to raise it with those who make the laws that we enforce. Uh, I don't think our job, and, I, and one of the things I am very proud of the FBI about, the, the FBI today is full of people who care about doing the right thing, not just doing the thing, if that makes any sense. Uh, and so I think our obligation is to try and understand, this is why it's critical to understand the people that we're serving and protecting and locking up. Uh, are we doing something that seems off track to us and inconsistent with our notions of what the right thing is? And if we see those things, we gotta raise our hands and we gotta shout about it. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Comey. My name's Erica Tillotson. I am a freshman here in the college and you mentioned the lives of the two fallen officers in New York, and I was wondering what you think we can do to restore the relationship between our criminal justice system and the citizens they serve, not only to restore the faith in the system, but also to preserve the safety of those officers. Well, I think a critical part of it is what I emphasized, to, uh, 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 phrasing I took from Bill Bratton, this notion that we need to see each other I think we in law enforcement have to drive an effort to have people understand us and the kind of people we are. And we're flawed because we're human beings. We've got all the normal flaws, but that we, who we are in the main, um, people need to see that. And as I said, that is, a, um, that is a block by block, precinct by precinct local effort, inviting people in. I mentioned getting out of your cars, both literally and figuratively. Uh, invite people in, have them see us and understand us, especially in the hardest hit neighborhoods. There's, those police officers were there in Bedford-Stuyvesant to protect a great historical community. Um, and it was, I think it's critical that we continue to just see each other up close. Now, there's lots of other smaller things, but frankly, the most important thing to me is, um, do we know the people we serve and do they know us? Right? Empathy is often a very short supply in human experience. That's where I mentioned the empathy to understand what that young black man walking home from the library might be thinking when we encounter him. That's critical for us. And it's really important for him to be thinking about how we see the world and why we're in that neighborhood patrolling. I think that, I worry that sounds vague and mushy, but that actually is, I think, the answer, more so than fixes to policy or technology. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Director. My name is Tomas, and I'm a Spanish student in the SFS. I'm a freshman. I want to ask a two-part question. The first is about the trend in the militarization of police. Uh, coming from Europe, seeing police with handguns or machine guns is something that seems strange. Excuse me, that seems strange. And the second is whether you think prisons or jails are accomplishing the role of not only putting away criminals, but also of helping them throughout their time in prison to then come out and be able to live in society. Yeah, the second one is uh, easy to answer. No, uh, better. Right? Lots of good people. It's one of the things that I think unites sort of. I don't know whether spectrum makes sense, right and left in America, and understanding that we have to do a better job at equipping people. Right? Every arrest, every conviction is a failure of us as a community, of a family, of an individual, helping that person come back out and be productive. We've long not done a good enough job at that, so that's an easy one to answer. The militarization one is harder. Here's the way I think about it. It's not about the stuff. Right? The stuff is, a, is, is neutral, right? A shield body armor, 
an armored vehicle, an automatic weapon, um, we in law enforcement need that stuff. In this country, unfortunately, we often face adversaries barricaded in a location who are firing high-powered weapons, trying to kill lots of innocent people. So I expect in every garage of every FBI office around the country, there will be an armored vehicle, there will be automatic weapons, there will be ballistic plating, because normal vests aren't gonna stop some of the high-powered rounds. I need the stuff. The, the issue is, so how do we use that stuff? And how do we train people to use that stuff? Right? Do we use that stuff to confront people who are, who are protesting when they're concerned about something in the community? Do we use a sniper rifle to seek closer to a crowd? That's where it breaks down. Right? And so when I've said this to chiefs and sheriffs all over the country, I've been, as I said, all over the country, I've visited all 56 of my field offices, I've said to every chief, group of chiefs and sheriffs, it's about the training and the discipline and the judgment about how we use it. It's not the stuff. So that's how I think about it. Hi, good morning, Director Comey. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Scott. I'm a staff member here and a recent um, a court school graduate. Um, I appreciated your discussion of the need for good data. And I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts on why you think local police departments don't report data if it's voluntary and what specifically the FBI can do to, to uh, compel or mandate or otherwise encourage departments to provide data. Yeah, we, I, I don't know fully the reasons why. Um, I suspect among them is uh, especially for smaller departments, it seems like a lot of work. Um, you know, filling out a federal form may be a big deal to folks. Um, we have developed a system uh, called NIBRS, the National Incident-Based Reporting System, which is designed to collect rich data about encounters between police and citizens. Um, and so I am limited in my ability to compel anybody uh, in the way in which our great country is structured, the federal state, uh, which all of you have studied. Uh, but I think I have a bully pulpit, in a way, to be able to encourage departments to use the NIBR system to collect the data, right? I mean, one of my frustrations is, right, I could go on Google right now and figure out uh, how many people does the CDC count went to emergency rooms with flu symptoms last week, right? You could tell me how many people to, at the absolute number, bought a particular book on Amazon. It's ridiculous that I can't tell you how many people were shot by the police in this country. Last week, last year, the last decade is ridiculous. And so I intend to take that notion that it's ridiculous to the men and women uniform around the country and say, it's ridiculous. Do you agree? If you agree, you got to fill out the form, we got to collect it. And I suppose the next step would be legislatures getting involved to try and compel it. I don't have that authority. I have uh, the, persuas the persuasion of argument and reason. Thank you. Good morning, Karina Robinson. I'm a graduate of 2004, back when it was GP PBI. And having served in the Army in combat along the JTTFs and uh, certainly um, learning through my doctorate program in Homeland Security, I'm so glad that you brought it full circle to probably what we really need the discussion to be about, community-oriented policing. Where you get out there, you know the community, you spend several years building that rapport and that trust. I uh, remember hearing Kathleen Lanier talk about, Chief Lanier talk about how anonymous tips, as soon as they came in, she dispatched a team, or she didn't do it, but dispatched a team, and there was an immediate respect by the community that they're really there to help us. So perhaps the challenge uh, for our state and local sheriffs and police departments is not to buy all that high-tech militarized equipment, new patrol cars, is to really get the training uh, to build their confidence, to get out in the communities, not to be afraid, establish that security and stability. But I, I feel that the linchpin is really getting the stats and the algorithms and all the data up to members of Congress so they truly believe that the funding is necessary to get that job done, and it's not going to be easy. So the FBI, Department of Justice, major organizations seem to have a lot more um, I guess, clout and getting that money a lot faster than the local or the state uh, level folks. So what would you hope from um, a community member that we call our mayors, we call our state legislators, we call members of Congress and say, don't forget community-oriented policing? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I think a big part of it is leaders of our towns and cities understanding that in many places they're starving the police department, uh, making it really, really hard for them 
to follow my advice to get out of their cars and get to know people. Right? Take the city of Detroit. I met with a detective there uh, who's working with us to try and reduce violent crime. And he was explaining to me, uh, not long ago, there were 5,000 police officers in Detroit. Today, there are 2,000. Right? So how do you patrol a city of that size with less than half of the officers you've long had, how do you get out of your car and walk around and see people? You're covering an area that's enormous, right? And then, as I said, cities across the country have cut funding for police departments to do things that seem small but are vital, like police athletic leagues, like citizens academies. Those things um, are maybe less high profile, but those are investments in the future, right? It's, what we're doing now in cities around the country is like a homeowner thinking, well, I'll save money, I just won't invest in repairing the roof, right? You're gonna be sorry. We all feel some of that sorrow right now. You must invest in that kind of maintenance of the relationship with the communities and support community policing, which is, requires resources. So we have time for one last question. Uh... Hi, I'm Grace Brennan, I'm a sophomore in the college. Um, I just have a quick question on sort of how to prompt a national dialogue with um, different perspectives. Um, a lot of people now see the value in seeing different perspectives from both law enforcement and race. However, a lot of this dialogue is prompted through polarized media outlets from both the left and the right. So how do you see um, sort of the tone changing nationally, um, people seeing both sides um, and what leaders can do to sort of change this perspective? That is a big, hard question. I'm probably not uh, qualified to answer it well, but I'll take a shot anyway. I'm sitting here with a microphone. Um, I think, you know, not to wax all idealistic on you, but I think we own the media outlets, right? They reflect us, right? They're not creating us, we're creating them. So I think it starts with all of us saying, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna try to imagine how others might see the world. It's the central challenge of human existence, right? I can only experience the world through me, but I must work to try and see the world through you. And I think if all of us start to feel that way, in a way we own the media outlets, they don't own us. So I, 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 I worry that it can be a bit of a cop out to say, well, we're polarized because the media is fractionalized. No, no, no. The media is fractionalized because of us. Right? We're responsible for that. And so the way we change that is the way we interact with each other. So I, I want to thank the, the director for, for coming here and, and, and hosting us on this very important topic. Uh, it, I think it's clearly uh, something that we, we think reflects our very values a, a, as a country uh, and, and shapes our future and something that we need to come to, to grips with, uh, both in law enforcement and, but as a community at large. So uh, we appreciate you coming and adding to this conversation. Georgetown is committed to continuing that, that dialogue. Uh, for those who are interested in participating in additional events, uh, Tomorrow at 1245 in the Healy Family uh, Center, there is going to be a lunch sponsored by our Center for Social Justice, the Office of Student Affairs, and the Office of Mission and Ministry to continue this, this conversation on Georgetown's campus. But we really appreciate you coming, Mr. Director, and, and, and talking to us here at Georgetown today. So Thanks for having me. Please join me. In the Thank you. Thank you.